Hi everybody, welcome back, glad you could tune in again. Okay, let's take a look at the book of Galatians. This, I think, is a deceptively tricky New Testament book to get to grips with. Personally, I've wrestled with it over the last few years or so, more than with any other single book of the New Testament. And it seems to me that there's a particular kind of problem that interpreters have faced as they've wrestled with this over the decades, and in fact, over the last few centuries. Let me illustrate. Uh, it's rather as if you imagine buying uh, a Lego model, uh, a big, complex Lego model of something like a bright red Chevy. And if you assemble it correctly, then what you'll have is a bright red Chevy that looks exactly like the picture on the box and there'll be no pieces left over and all the pieces will be in the right place and everything will be just fine. That's what the book of Galatians is like. But there's a problem because if you get all those pieces and you didn't really follow the instructions, you just sort of set to trying to put things together, you could end up with something that looked, well, a little bit like what was on the box. Not exactly, but it could be close enough to fool the people who were looking at the model and maybe close enough even to fool you into thinking that you had actually got the uh, model exactly right, exactly as it ought to be. Uh, maybe you have a few bits left over. Maybe there'd be a few bits missing that you kind of needed. But you could, so to speak, take all the different parts of that model and assemble them slightly differently to get something which looks superficially right. But once you look in detail, you realize, no, this isn't quite how it's supposed to be. Now, that seems to me is what's going on with the book of Galatians. Most of the individual verses and short mini sections are not in themselves really, really hard to understand. But what seems to have happened over the centuries is that there have been a variety of different ways in which this thing has been put together with some quite different end results. So what I'd like to do is partly uh, I want to just give you first in this video a very, very brief, very much a summary overview of what I think the, the shape of the whole thing is like. And then I'm hoping, Lord willing, in a subsequent video to spend a bit more time to dig a little bit deeper, so to speak, and to go through not quite a verse at a time, but just to lay out what it seems to me are some of the ways in which these individual pieces of the puzzle, of the model, so to speak, ought to be read to show you really that this is how the thing ought to fit together. So this video, I guess, will be hopeful. Hopefully, uh, it'll be useful for anybody uh, who's uh, reading the book of Galatians, you know, you've read it a few times before, you want to get back into it a little bit. The next video, the slightly longer one, will I hope be uh, instructive and helpful for you if you've already spent a bit of time wrestling with the book of Galatians and you're aware of some of the complexities and the debates surrounding it and you want to try and uh, wrestle with some of those more complex and nuanced issues. So without further ado, here's a really brief, superficial, but I hope nonetheless accurate broad overview of how the letter fits together. In Galatians, Paul is addressing uh, a problem that's arisen in the church in Galatia, where a number of people within the church are turning away from Christ back to some of the structures that used to characterize their way of life under the old covenant as Jewish believers. As they do so, they're imposing those same restrictions on other people, Gentile believers. In particular, observance of the law and circumcision as a, a rite by which, a ritual by which people are marked as members, oh, excuse me, marked as members of the people of God. Now, Paul wrote to correct that misunderstanding, and in chapter 1, he first expresses his absolute astonishment and horror that this misunderstanding could have taken hold. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you and turning to a different gospel, chapter 1, verse 6. It's quite a sharp letter. And in the second half of chapter 1, Paul begins to assert the authority that he has from the living God by which he purports to oppose the false gospel that is being preached in Galatia. Now, in chapter 2, he insists that 
his message, the gospel for the Gentiles, was accepted by the other apostles in Jerusalem. That's an important point because, of course, it was Jerusalem that the gospel it was in Jerusalem that the gospel to the Jews originated and where many in Jerusalem were uh, wanting to impose some of these Jewish rites and rituals and so on on the Gentile church. Uh, Paul insists that, no, 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 his view of the gospel was endorsed by the other apostles. It was even endorsed by Peter, but Paul had to rebuke Peter, he recounts that in the middle of chapter 2, for actually making the kind of mistake that other people were making. Peter was acting hypocritically by refusing to eat with Gentiles, and Paul recalls that he rebuked him for that. Now, from chapter 2, verse 15, all the way through to the end of chapter 3, Paul argues at some length that we are justified, so marked as righteous and declared to be within the family of the people of God, belonging to God our Heavenly Father, not by works of the law, but by faith in Christ. That's an extended and somewhat complex argument in chapters 2 and 3. And that is in keeping, he insists, end of chapter 3, with the promise that God made to Abraham, which of course predates the law that was given to Moses. Then in chapter 4, he picks up that theme from chapter 3, that the law was a temporary uh, schoolmaster or tutor. That's the end of chapter 3. He picks up that, that theme. The law was never intended to be permanent, was also always uh, something put in charge for a while to lead the people of God to Christ. And the promised gospel age has now dawned. We're no longer slaves under the old covenant, under the law. We are sons of God and heirs through Christ, towards the end of chapter 4. Then in chapters 5 and 6, he insists that we should turn away from what has now become slavery if we were to go back to the Old Covenant regulations, the Old Covenant law and circumcision and so on. That would be slavery now. We're now sons. We're born for freedom. And Paul lays out in chapters 5 and 6 what that freedom should look like as we seek to keep in step with the Spirit and not walk according to the flesh. So that is Galatians 1-6 to really in a nutshell. As I said, um, I'm hoping, Lord willing, in a later video to go into a bit more detail to just dig into some of the nuts and bolts of why it seems to me that's the best way to uh, assemble these various uh, pieces and uh, actually to try and explore some of the details a little bit more. But I hope that's helpful for now, just to help you to get into the letter and to see where the argument goes. Uh, for now, uh, the Lord bless you and I hope very much indeed to see you soon. Bye for now.